This is Epicenter, episode 389, with guests Phil Dayan and Stefan Goslin. Hi, welcome to Epicenter. This is Friederike Ernst. And this is Sunny Agarwal. And today we're here with Phil and Stefan, um, the co-founders of Flashbots, which is this very on-trend MEV project um, that we'll talk about in just a bit. Hi, Phil, and hi, Stefan. Hey, great to be here. Hello, hello. Before we get started, um, let me tell you about our sponsors today. So our first sponsor is Exodus. Exodus is an easy-to-use wallet which supports hundreds of assets and has native apps for all platforms, including iOS and Android. And as a fully non-custodial wallet, they are firm believers in the not your keys, not your coins mantra. Go to exodus.com and give it a try. We would also like to thank Paraswap. Paraswap is our second sponsor today, and it, they just came out with a huge update that's even faster and more liquid. It's cheaper than Uniswap and comes with a new gas token that can cut your gas fees by up to 50%. Plus, for our listeners, Paraswap offers 50% gas refunds for the first swap, swap of at least one ETH. Make your trade and go to paraswap.io epicenter to claim your refund. Finally, we have Solana. Solana is a next-generation blockchain with lightning-fast blocks and fees less than one cent per transaction. Scalability is perhaps the biggest challenge facing crypto from becoming the backbone of the world's financial system. And today, Solana might well be the best solution we have. Go to solana.com slash epicenter to learn more. Hi, Phil and Stefan. Um, good, good to have you guys on the show. Just for a little bit of background, um, can you briefly um, explain to us... Um, how you entered the crypto arena. And I mean, both of you have been around for a long time. I know that Stefan, you were at Numerai before you started Flashbots. And Phil, um, I, I think everyone knows you from your uh, DEX studies um, that have been around for a while. Um, so maybe Stefan, can we start with you? Sure. Um, I think I've told this story a couple of times, but I, it's always a fun one, I think, in this context, because um, Phil's the one of the first people that I, I met in this space. Um, and I think it was back in 2017, I just showed up at an obscure conference in the middle of nowhere, upstate New York, um, and was told about smart contracts. And it blew my mind, um, given that I had zero idea what the hell anyone was talking about, but everyone sounded really smart. Um, so I decided to uh, dive in, um, and I haven't looked back. So I um, have been working on Ethereum since then, every layer of the stack, um, and always trying to find the next uh, problem to solve. Um, and uh, yeah, that led me to, uh, to MEV. Cool. What about you, Phil? Oh, yeah. I've been, in, I've been in crypto for a little while, so I've always been very passionate about kind of privacy and anonymity technologies. I think... I first uh, started looking into Bitcoin around 2012 uh, in the very, very early days of the Silk Road uh, because I was working on Tor at the time. And obviously it was an application that made some waves in the in the community and made some uh, real world impact. Uh, so ever since then, I've been working on various kind of Bitcoin related uh, black, white and gray hat side projects. Um, decided kind of then that I would transition into full time cryptocurrency and also that I wanted to do it in academia because I thought there was really a need for some deeper, longer term thinking on some hard problems facing the industry uh, that I saw as kind of blind spots. Uh, and also to kind of forward the the cause of cryptocurrencies in academia and kind of communicate to people that there is something interesting here and there is something unique and like your skepticism is warranted, but also suspend it for a second and try to imagine uh, kind of how you would redesign things with these abstractions uh, and whether that's useful to your life. Uh, and so that's kind of been my message ever since. Uh, I've worked on proof of stake protocols. I've worked on uh, all sorts of uh, security research on smart contracts. And that led me to DEXs and that led me to kind of MEV and analyzing uh, user fairness and security properties of DEXs, which is what we're going to talk about today, I guess. So you mentioned Black Hat. So Phil, DAO attacker confirmed? No, I'm not the DAO attacker. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> We've been trying to get you on for a little while, actually. So, you know, you were working on some other cool stuff as well, like, you know, 
the gas token stuff and like, you know, just earlier, like, you know, very, a lot of early MEV research. How did that, how did that all like kind of lead you uh, to like working on Flashbots? Oh God, it's like such a deep rabbit hole and everything connects to everything else. Like if you're a listener on this podcast and you're kind of new to MEV or you just heard about it in the last few months, like you will explore all of these topics of like, how are resources priced in in blockchains? How does this relate to futures and options? How does this relate to market fairness? What is the market design space? How does that relate to computer security? How does that relate to economics? These are all questions I've spent a lot of time thinking about. Uh, my Twitter bio is grasping for tractability because it's just such a huge design space that like, you know, you can dabble in kind of any corner of it and have some obvious insights that feed back into production and feed back into people's lives. Uh, so yeah, all my DEX work and gas token is kind of an example of just thinking through these problems uh, from first principles and kind of coming to certain conclusions about how we can design mechanisms um, and where weaknesses are in current mechanisms um, and trying to communicate that to the community. So that led to my initial work on DEX arbitrage and, and how DEXs are unfair and also to kind of gas token, uh, which is kind of almost an economic exploit on Ethereum itself that's getting neutered in the upcoming London hard fork. Uh, shout out to anyone who holds gas token. Um, also, yeah, I'm sorry for not coming on earlier. It's worth noting I've, I've, I've you know, made my career ignoring pretty much everyone in the space who tries to contact me. So if you're listening and that's you, it's like truly not personal and I'm sorry. <laughs> I really try my best. <laughs> oh, I feel I feel so honored now. <laughs> so, so Phil, can you talk about flashbots and what the problem was that you were trying to solve here? Yeah, so uh, kind of the original thing that brought me to MEV was thinking about what is smart contract security. And in thinking about that and in thinking about what people really wanted to build in the early days, which was decentralized exchanges and permissionless exchanges, it kind of naturally brought me to the question of fairness because I don't consider an exchange secure if it's unfair to users. So if there's systematic and kind of patent unfairness built into the design, I think we should exclude that from kind of considering it secure as a community. Uh, so I started trying to define what is security from a formal perspective, which led me to thinking about fairness and fairness in early DEX designs and kind of where designs fell short, which led me into kind of the front running bots, MEV kind of consensus layer on fairness and insecurity angle of this um, and really got me concerned about the possible concentration of power posed to the mining and validation game uh, because of MEV. So uh, we're going to talk more about what MEV is, but MEV is basically money that miners and validators can make by choosing or manipulating certain aspects of the system they have control over. Extra money on the table from things like censoring users or reordering their transactions or putting one user's transactions in front of another or putting their own transactions kind of into the transaction stream. Uh, so because miners and validators have all this power and because the MEV world is so complex and so hard to programmatically explore, and because it's such a profitable, lucrative area, it's kind of a triple threat of uh, having the potential to centralize cryptocurrencies and get rid of these fairness properties and these decentralization properties we all enjoy and that all brought us to these systems in the first place. Uh, and I think that really has the potential to erode the trust guarantees of cryptocurrencies, the fairness guarantees of cryptocurrencies, and the, the effectiveness of cryptocurrencies in the market. Um, so in solving this problem, it became clear to me that we really need an organization that satisfies two properties. Number one is that it thinks extremely long term. And number two is that it's extremely aligned with all aspects of cryptocurrency incentives. Uh, and we've designed Flashbots kind of very defensively. Uh, maybe Stefan can talk more about that for these two goals uh, specifically. Um, a big part of that is, for example, we don't have a token uh, right now. And that's because we don't want to bake in certain aspects of the incentive structure or kind of get ahead of ourselves uh, in designing this network. We want to make sure that any structure we build aligns absolutely everyone in the cryptocurrency ecosystem. And that's why uh, we, we've chosen to do this through open source software, um, which is kind of the tradition of cryptocurrencies and, and free software and open source software before it. Uh, that just kind of people are incentivized to run and people are incentivized to fork and build off of, but also makes people think critically about MEV and about what this means and about where the future of this industry is going uh, and establishes Flashbots as kind of a hub for that kind of activity. So Stefan, you want to tell us a little bit about like what are the, you know, practical products right now that Flashbots is building? The way that we have been approaching the problem is one, we know that there's some extremely long-term 
research questions that need to be answered um, and questions for which we uh, we don't have all the answers to yet. Um, yet at the same time, we have high conviction that there are some immediate uh, uh, costs incurred by all actors in the system, as well as risks uh, that uh, will take place uh, in a few years' time. If the ecosystem around MEV extraction goes in certain directions, um, and uh, we believe that the best way to uh, help guarantee the most positive future possible uh, and the most healthy ecosystem of MEV extraction is to start building products that, um, that enable the users to define um, the kinds of properties that they want to, uh, to maintain on their platforms. So uh, we sort of dubbed the initial blog post that we released, Front Running the MEV Crisis. Um, and that's very much so because we observed a lot of alternative uh, mempool infrastructure being built out. Uh, so private uh, uh, communication channels between uh, bot operators or traders and, uh, and miners. Um, and these, um, we were very worried that these uh, uh, communication channels wouldn't have the property of credible neutrality and wouldn't necessarily be aligned with uh, the rest of the ecosystem participants, uh, including the users. Um, so what we set out to build initially is a communication channel that uh, has those properties. Um, so is able to uh, show some level of credible neutrality um, and efficiency that helps mitigate some of the immediate costs as well as uh, uh, is built defensively against some of the more longer term risks of, uh, of uh, centralization and, and consensus and stability. Um, so we call this the Flashbots core infrastructure. Uh, we released that in uh, the beginning of the year, so uh, just about January 1st, um, and we've seen uh, a lot of interest uh, from the community to, uh, to start running this, this open source software. Um, so I think where we stand today, we have between 60 to 80% of, uh, of Ethereum uh, hash rates, so Ethereum miners, uh, that have adopted uh, uh, this system. Um, and uh, and and uh, are are sort of using it to um, to most efficiently extract the the MEV opportunities that are available on chain. Let's get to our sponsor, Exodus. Exodus is a fantastic cryptocurrency wallet that strikes the right balance between ease of use, security, and great features. You can get Exodus on the iPhone, desktop app, web app, Android, whatever platform you use. It's a non-custodial wallet and that is so critical because what's the point of crypto if you don't control your own assets? With Exodus, you always do. They're old school and they've been around since 2015. Over 1.2 million users rely on Exodus so you know that they've stood the test of time. They have support for over 100 different crypto assets and from within Exodus, you can easily change one different asset to the other. They also allow you to buy crypto with fiat and they even have a great offer where you can buy up to $500 worth of crypto through their iOS app and pay just $1 in fee. So go to exodus.com slash epicenter and check out their wallet. We want to thank Exodus for their amazing support of Epicenter. Can we quickly talk about what MEV is very practically. So basically, um, I mean, Phil, you already said that it has to do with ordering transactions and sandwiching your own transactions and so on. Can you give an example? Yeah, I can talk a bit about practically uh, the kinds of uh, MEV that we've been seeing. Um, so MEV sort of stands for minor extractable value, uh, but uh, we've been pushing to re rename uh, the, the term to maximal extractable value. Um, and as Phil mentioned, it's just any value that can be extracted from um, the right of ordering transactions and selecting which transactions get included in the block. So this exists uh, with miners today, but it exists with validators in any proof of stake system and with sequencers in any layer two system. Um, so the idea is uh, typically these uh, the incentive for, for miners on Ethereum is to just order by gas price uh, all the transactions coming in and, and simply place the, uh, the transactions in the block and, and mine them. However, um, there might be some opportunities that uh, exist on chain based on the state. So for example, an arbitrage opportunity between two decentralized exchanges, um, which 
uh, might be underpriced by the incoming uh, transactions in the transaction pool. Um, and so there's sort of a clear incentive for a miner in this case to insert a transaction, which takes advantage of, uh, of this arbitrage opportunity. Um, now, perhaps a way to think about MEV is not as a single concept, and, and perhaps Phil has some more thoughts on, on a taxonomy for this. Um, I like to think about it as information spheres. Um, so there's sort of realms of uh, MEV strategies that are based purely on the state of the blockchain. Uh, what is the state of all the different smart contracts that are on Ethereum and, and where the value are? And is there a way to uh, send a transaction that's able to redistribute value around uh, that uh, maximizes my gains? Then there's a layer of information above that, which is the transaction pool. So knowing all the state of the chain plus the state of the transaction pool, is there some reordering of the transactions that I can do to be able to maximize my um, uh, my my benefit, my, my revenues? Then one step above that would be to look at uh, third party ecosystems. Uh, so for example, looking at the price of certain assets and how they're trading on centralized exchanges, and then comparing that to the decentralized exchanges. Um, so then we quickly get into a situation where uh, MEV encompasses essentially all the information in the world. And it's uh, it becomes uh, who has the belief on what the most accurate uh, state of the world is and how to represent that on a immutable blockchain to uh, extract the most amount of value possible. You asked about specific examples. Uh, so I think the categories of MEV that we see the most, uh, we try to label them on um, a dashboard called uh, MEV Explore. It's available at explore.flashbots.net. And uh, so far, uh, we've seen mostly uh, arbitrage uh, being uh, the largest source of uh, MEV act, uh, activity, um, but uh, other types of strategies have been on the rise. Um, so on the one hand, we have liquidations, which uh, which happen whenever there's sort of a, a lot of volatility uh, in the market and, and large drawdowns in, in price. Uh, we've seen a lot of uh, white hat type of uh, rescues uh, that are trying to uh, either secure a protocol or, um, or perhaps uh, black hat activity that are trying to exploit a protocol. Um, and we've also seen more and more uh, uh, decentralized exchange sandwiching. So using some of the specific mechanics in, in decentralized exchanges like Uniswap to be able to uh, to make a, a, a cut based on the, the mechanisms that are used for um, for uh, allowing uh, variable pricing in the quoting mechanisms. Um, so these are all uh, strategies that um, honestly change on a daily, if not weekly basis. Um, so uh, another uh, interesting sort of thread of stories, uh, and I recommend you guys follow um, one of our uh, new product manager, um, Robert Miller on, on Twitter, um, he's been putting out really great threads that highlight some of the more uh, exotic uh, types of MEV activity that we've seen, uh, like uh, certain MEV bots turning e, uh, uh, evil against other MEV bots and trying to attack them for, uh, for, for profit. Um, so uh, it changes yeah, on a daily basis, a weekly basis, and uh, there's always some really interesting uh, stories to follow uh, in this space. Yeah, to kind of expand on that a little bit, uh, I, I think MEV is something that's really fundamental to permissionless systems to get a little bit more philosophical about it. Um, what we're trying to build here is systems that, that people can audit, that are auditable cryptographically without requiring trust uh, in certain third parties and kind of minimizing the trust assumptions that, uh, that we use and making as many of those trust assumptions kind of automated and easy to audit and verify as possible. Um, so that being the philosophical goal and us wanting this concept of decentralization where people all over the world contribute to outcomes and have a voice, there's kind of going to be this natural value distribution among all the possible outcomes of the system, right? So like whether I get mine before Stefan or vice versa, um, the, all the possible kind of inputs that all these people have into the system and the related output that comes from combining their inputs has value to kind of everyone in the world as these systems grow. Um, so, so what's new in these systems is kind of the ability to condition payments based on this fact in a really efficient way that again requires no additional trust assumptions. 
um, which means fundamentally the security of these systems. And this is something Vitalik really explored a lot in like 2017, 2018, when he was trying to create a framework for how to secure Ethereum, uh, Ethereum from like a theoretical point of view. Um, the security of a lot of these systems has to be done in a bribery kind of model. Uh, and while bribery is a dirty word, all that really means is that people can really efficiently condition payment on preferences um, in a way that kind of structurally doesn't really care about necessarily the moral implications of that. Um, and we want to use that infrastructure to build systems that are fair for users and build systems that are better than existing financial systems anyway. Um, so MEV kind of comes from uh, this ability for validators to, to kind of have different economic values of their different choices in the systems. And it, as Stefan says, it happens in proof of work systems. Um, I recommend the paper Flash Boys 2.0, which was kind of the paper that defined MEV. It does a deep dive into the arbitrage and decentralized exchange case of MEV. But as these systems grow, MEV is kind of everywhere in all of their operations and anywhere different people might prefer different outcomes. Not only that, but it's also fundamental to how a lot of these things are built. So the reason why Uniswap works as an exchange and the reason why it always offers users a market price at any time without requiring a counterparty is because the counterparty is basically all of these bots and all these miners that are being paid and incentivized through systematic rents uh, to do trading activity that brings the price to a market price or to some reasonable margin. Um, and we've set up these activities and, and they kind of execute because they're profitable. And that's a fundamental component of why Uniswap is permissionless, right? Anyone can come in and anyone can arb Uniswap back to the mean and anyone can profit from it. That introduces robustness more than having a certain permissioned order or a certain sequencer or a certain centralized source of authority. The same is true for liquidations. So MakerDAO is a system that tries to build a stable coin with a token that's uh, uh, that's kind of floats in price with the dollar against Ethereum. And the way they do this is through debt positions uh, that are collateralized by cryptocurrencies and other assets. Um, and as the price of these assets changes, sometimes this debt needs to be repossessed in a liquidation event. Uh, and this collateral needs to be sold to maintain the stability of the system. If that process fails, the system collapses. So that process is fundamental to the goal of this system. Um, now the question is, how do we decentralize this process so everyone has input? Well, that's very hard to do without economic incentives. And then that's very hard to do without creating this preference distribution over these economic incentives and therefore this value uh, that comes from these validators and which kind of input they provide to the system. Um, and this value is kind of where Flashbots is focused, uh, especially in Ethereum today. Uh, how, how do miners kind of interact with this value and how does this value flow in the system? Um, and it's a very complex space and, and there are many, many different types. Basically any kind of smart contract has MEV. So I encourage all users and DApp developers, like think very carefully, where is the MEV in my transaction, in my system, in whatever I'm interacting with. You know, most people book flights on travel aggregators to get more options and the best prices for the travel plans. So when you're making DeFi swaps, use Paraswap. It beats market prices across all major DEXs. And thanks to their network of professional market makers, you'll get zero slippage on your trades. They just pushed a huge update that's even faster and more liquid thanks to a brand new algorithm. It's cheaper than Uniswap, and it comes with a new gas token that cuts your gas fees by up to 50%. It's no wonder MetaMask, Argent, and Monolith all rely on the Paraswap API. So give Paraswap a try at paraswap.io slash epicenter. This URL allows you to claim a 50% refund on gas fees for your first swap of at least one ETH. This offer is available until May 1st, 2021, and refunds will be made every Friday starting April 9th. We'd like to thank Paraswap for their support of Epicenter. So would it be fair to define like MEV as this sort of edge that miners have in this like value game because they don't play by the same rules as everyone else. Exactly. Yeah. So miners are in somewhat of a, of a privileged position, if you want to call it that. I don't, I think that word is like legally and trust loaded. So maybe not the best one, but they're in an advantaged position to take advantage of this. Uh, and that's why it's called miner extractable value, right? So a lot of people are confused. They're like, oh, there are bots extracting this value. The miners are not playing this game. Uh, we have a leaderless protocol. There are no miners. All these kind of uh, gut reactions to MEV 
The reason that it's called minor extractable value is because in proof of work blockchains, the miners are in the ultimate position to have the ultimate advantage. So in the game theoretic long term equilibrium, it's the miners who are able to extract the value, right? Any permissionless value is best extracted by the miners because the miners can do any permissionless stuff from a better vantage point than the users. Uh, so that's why even if today bots are, are, are taking it or it's being left on the table or it's a hack no one's discovered, it's still value that is able to be extracted by miners. And it's still relevant to things like the consensus metagame and the blockchain network security and the properties users are getting from their protocols and how we design dApps and how dApps interact with each other. Um, so all these kind of follow from, from viewing MEV in this framework and thinking through that to its logical conclusion. Phil, this is super fascinating. And um, I think we'll dive into the moral consequences of MEV in, in just a bit. But maybe let's take it from the top. Maybe let's talk about how exactly it actually works. So you said that 80% of the miners currently run the Flashbots. The Flashbots fork of the Geth client, I think, is probably the, the right way to put this. So can you tell us about um, the Ethereum client that you forked and what exactly it does differently? than the, uh, uh, the regular Geth client? Sure, I can get into that. So basically, Flashbots built this system called MEV Geth, which is a patch on top of Geth. Um, and really what we did was write a reference implementation. And each miner actually uh, builds their own version of it. Um, we sort of entered a level of sophistication on the miner side where all these these companies have uh, teams of developers in-house that build custom infrastructure. Um, and so it's very difficult for them to introduce any sort of third-party code uh, uh, that's not uh, core Geth uh, code. Um, and they'd prefer just write the the, the code themselves uh, in many cases. Um, so we uh, essentially published a reference uh, implementation for um, a patch on top of Geth uh, that opens a, uh, a new RPC or a new communication channel for uh, third parties to submit uh, arrays of transactions instead of only being able to submit a single transaction. Then um, inside of the, um, the Geth node itself, um, we uh, created a, a, a new worker. Um, so workers are, the, um, are essentially parts of the, the node that are in charge of producing blocks and validating blocks. Um, and, and determining um, how much value those, those blocks um, uh, contain. Um, so by creating a new worker, what we've been able to do is, uh, uh, in parallel, create both a regular block as well as a block that contains some of these arrays of transactions uh, that are submitted um, uh, from, uh, from the, the Flashbots network. These arrays of transactions all compete against each other uh, for being included at the top of uh, this new block. Um, so instead of relying on uh, gas price and, and competing in the memory pool, uh, basically what we're saying is we're replacing the uh, typical gas auction for um, that orders by gas price with a new auction, which um, evaluates the value of each of the bundles and only includes uh, the best one at the top of the block. Um, one of the core properties that this, uh, this new approach gives us is um, users no longer have to pay for reverted transactions. Um, and so this saves a lot of the uh, space um, that is uh, used by um, PGA bot operators um, that uh, try to aim for an opportunity, uh, but get beat to it. Um, that's all block space that can be reuse, reused uh, for uh, other types of transactions uh, in the network. Um, so to summarize, uh, basically MEV Geth, a patch on top of Geth, it's a new communication channel which allows for uh, uh, submitting uh, transactions directly to the miner in a private fashion and uh, removes uh, any sort of uh, reverted transactions from, uh, from the Ethereum blockchain. And so who who submits the transactions or the ordering of the transactions to the miner? Can anyone do that? So right now we're in the alpha stage of the system. Uh, so uh, we have uh, some technical limitations uh, around uh, privacy and spam protection that have to be mitigated through uh, trusted uh, relay operators. Um, so Flashbots operates a relay uh, that collects uh, bundles, as we call them, uh, arrays of transactions from a network of, of different participants. 
Um, these, uh, these participants, we call them searchers, and they really are just any Ethereum user that wants to, for whatever reason, communicate their uh, transactions directly to the miner uh, and sidestep the, uh, the typical mempool. Um, so these can be uh, existing bot operators who are doing arbitrage or liquidations, uh, but they can also be regular users who are looking to um, get their transactions included uh, in the Ethereum blockchain without being front run. So without anyone else in the network seeing their transactions in the uh, pending transaction pool. Uh, so uh, once they submit those transactions to a relayer, the relayer is able to validate them and, and forward them over to, uh, to the miners. And then um, what happens then? So basically the, the miners then get these private orderings and private transactions. And um, how, how do they decide what to include in which block? Sure. Uh, so they evaluate all the different transactions uh, and they look at both the gas price as well as the direct transfers of ETH to the Coinbase. Um, and they essentially do the sealed bid auction. Uh, so uh, without anyone in uh, any of the submitters knowing what is the uh, value of the other bundles that they're being compared against, the miner just picks the most uh, profitable bundle and includes that at the top of the next block. And how is the searcher then compensated for this? So the searcher is uh, actually the one that defines the price that they're willing to pay to the miner. Uh, so Phil mentioned uh, the concept of a bribe, and, and that's very much so the equivalent of a, a fee payment for regular transactions. Um, as a searcher, what I have to do is I see an arbitrage opportunity or any other opportunity on chain, and I determine how much that opportunity is worth to me. Um, then I have to determine how much of that value I'm willing to transfer to the miner uh, to, uh, to uh, bid for inclusion uh, in, in the block that I want. So the payment uh, is uh, conditional on how, much the, uh, how valuable that opportunity is to the searcher, as well as how much competition there is for that opportunity. Let's get to our sponsor, Solana. Now, this is a special ad for me to read because I've been a deep supporter of this project since meeting the Solana team back in 2018. I invest personally in the project and my company, Course One, is super deeply involved in the Solana ecosystem, including running the biggest validator. So what's so cool about Solana? Well, we all know that scalability is the single most important issue facing the blockchain industry today. And the Solana blockchain is an amazing solution for it. The network supports thousands of transactions per second with 400 millisecond block times and over 500 validators. The special thing about Solana is also that it's not a sharded blockchain. It's a single blockchain hyper-optimized for performance. So that makes it really easy to maintain composability between all of the apps on Solana so that they work together seamlessly now and forever. The Solana ecosystem is growing at a rapid pace and it's a great place to build your project or just get involved with the community. So go to solana.com slash epicenter to learn more. So Stefan, um, how, how do, I would assume that the opportunities are fairly standard and bots will kind of find them by just looking at transactions in the mempool. So I would assume that different participants kind of find the same opportunities so how do you how do you prevent them from grim triggering each other yeah great question so there's i think a very 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 extremely large set of types of opportunities um, we have this this nice graph i think that we put out in our, our february transparency report uh, by the way uh, you know because we want to make sure we are aligned with the community we publish uh, sort of on a monthly basis or as, as much as we're capable to stick to that schedule um, reports on the, the state of the network um, and and we're always looking for feedback and, and questions uh, for how we can improve the transparency of the system. So in the February transparency report, we have this graph that shows um, the theoretical um, MEV, uh, which is sort of this large circle. Um, the uh, current MEV that gets extracted, which is a somewhat smaller circle, um, and the MEV that we've been able to, to map uh, using uh, with MEV Explorer as a, an even smaller circle. So the, 
the point that this chart aims to make is that uh, MEV strategies is extremely broad um, and is defined by the complexity of all the different possible combinations of smart contracts that you have on chain. And uh, what is the most a complex set of interactions that you can have to be able to extract the most value. So um, under this framework, an arbitrage and a liquidation are very simple interactions, right? That only target maybe one or two protocol, um, but you could have MV opportunities that span hundreds of different protocols. Um, I think in the typical financial markets, right? Um, there was a lot of concerns that uh, too many uh, exchanges would create too much arbitrage opportunities. And we were looking at like 10 exchanges or like 15 exchanges. But then you go into a, a permissionless system like Ethereum and anyone can fork Uniswap and, and create a new exchange out of it. Um, so you feasibly have thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of different exchanges with arbitrage opportunities between all of them. Um, so it becomes uh, extremely computationally complex uh, and, and computationally demanding to be able to identify uh, uh, what the optimal extraction value is. Um, and so there's a lot of room for co competition and specialization. Um, now, that being said, uh, there are very simple strategies. So uh, the uh, Uniswap sandwiches or the Uniswap to SushiSwap arbitrage uh, are very uh, simple strategies. And we've actually published a an open source uh, trading strategy for uh, Uniswap to SushiSwap arbitrage. Um, and we've seen really interestingly over time, right, the percentage of the value being transferred to the miner being bid up um, towards uh, uh, nearly 100% for the miner. So this is something that we expect to keep uh, happening, where um, whoever does the most amount of research up front and discovers quote unquote new alpha um, is able to extract it for a very uh, uh, little fee, right? Is able to keep most of the value. Uh, but over time, as other searchers are become aware of of um, of this alpha and the alpha leaks, um, we expect the value to uh, transfer to the miner to be gradually bid up to 100, uh, which is sort of this, this grim trigger that, that you're speaking of. Um, so the end results for a lot of the very simple uh, strategies will be to have the full... Um, the full payment being sent to uh, to the miners, uh, but this might change uh, depending on the complexity of the strategies. So the speed of the alpha decay may uh, will will uh, be strategy specific. So hopefully that gives some some insights on how these different uh, strategies evolve over time. Yeah, and it's it's also worth noting that I think this is the best for all ecosystem participants. So as we mentioned, our goal is to align incentives. I think it's inevitable that miners will extract most simple MEV because if we build any system where that's not the case, they will build their own bots and they will run their own bots and they will extract the MEV because it's more profitable. So we actually want it to be the case that MEV that's kind of well known in the community is fully extracted efficiently by the miners and all the profit goes to miners. That's actually the best for consensus security too. It turns MEV into the most predictable and stable form of miner fee uh, that, that helps rather than hurts potentially network security in some cases. Uh, so that's kind of the best case scenario for those simple opportunities. We want kind of an efficient engine that at all times is sending as much profit to the miner, which is naturally what's going to happen when either you have a lot of bots competing and margins go really low, or the opportunity is simple enough that miners actually run their own bots that send all the profit to themselves. So when they mine their own blocks, they'll kind of make all that money. And when other people mine their blocks, they'll also kind of be in that competitive uh, landscape. Uh, so we're not against that kind of participant uh, participation either. We want to make sure that even from a minor point of view, uh, if they are kind of tempted to develop MEV infrastructure, they're incentivized to do that in an open, permissionless, decentralized way as well. So that's kind of how we think about uh, incentives. Um, of course, we also want to incentivize a robust, decentralized network of worldwide participants and smart people who are thinking about what is the latest MEV and like, how do we optimize things? Um, if we don't have that, it'll actually open all our DeFi systems up to attack, right? Because any group of smart people like that can then come in and kind of uh, wreak havoc on the entire system. So we want to incentivize people to constantly be at that bleeding edge. And we think that the, the Flashbots kind of decentralized searcher competition model at first, when there's not that much competition, pushes people towards that bleeding edge where all the profit is. 
It incentivizes development of new strategies and of more robust infrastructure. And over time, that infrastructure kind of gets naturally folded into the open source and into the kind of uh, corpus of MEV strategies that's efficiently going to the miner and and, uh, subsidizing network security. So that's kind of how we view uh, the incentive landscape playing out in kind of the short to medium term. You mentioned that it it's p- part of it is the, it's the most predictable. So I, I agree with a lot of what you said, but I don't understand why you think it's the most predictable. Isn't it actually perhaps one of the most unpredictable uh, forms of like minor incentivization where like, you know, something like block rewards is actually what's, you know, probably the most predictable. And then something like EIP 1559 fees are like, you know, probably more predictable. Like this seems very unpredictable because you actually have no idea of like really knowing what the MEV on a chain is. Yeah, so MEV is inherently less predictable than these things. I really meant predictable like from the perspective of MEV. Uh, like if you have some blocks where you're extracting 100% of MEV and some blocks where you're extracting 10% of MEV, depending on the miner, I consider that like a less predictable ecosystem than like every single block has 85% of available MEV um, kind of extracted. So within the MEV infrastructure, it also depends how various participants are kind of extracting it, where that value is going, um, and how efficiently kind of what's being left on the table is being collected rather than being left to accumulate and fueling kind of more variance and more unpredictability in the system. So what's stopping the miners from just using the information um, given by the searchers on how to order things in an optimal fashion um, and just using that without uh, without paying anything? Sure. So... It's really interesting, right? Because miners have this privileged position. Uh, they would be able technically to uh, front run any arbitrary transaction that uh, get, that gets sent, sent to them. And one of the challenges that we that we wanted to solve is that we saw a mounting incentive for miners to do so, uh, especially as transaction fees could potentially go down, as E2 uh, sort of looming around the corner, um, the incentive for miners to become active participant in this MEV extraction uh, becomes greater and greater. Um, the best way to mitigate that is to create an efficient auction mechanism that makes sure that the miners are sort of fairly compensated for the opportunities um, and and have minimal incentive to perform the extraction uh, themselves. Now, within the Flashbot system itself, uh, there's still some risk of the miner being able to front run the uh, the Flashbots bundles as they're coming in, um, because at this point in time in the um, in the Flashbots alpha. It essentially relies on trust and uh, guiding principles to ensure that the system is operating um, in a uh, in a stable and fair fashion. Over time, what we want to do is develop some cryptographic uh, approaches um, that provide the same guarantees, uh, but without the aspect of trust. Um, so uh, basically, what's required for um, MEV extraction to become completely trustless is a private uh, transaction pool where a user of Ethereum can communicate a certain set of preferences on transactions and, and their order uh, their ordering to a, um, to a miner without the miner having any idea what is the content of the transactions until they are mined in the chain. Um, and at that point, it becomes economically infeasible for um, for the miner to uh, to to extract it. Um, so there's a number of different approaches to achieving this. Um, some of them use commit reveal uh, systems, um, but some other ones uh, use uh, sort of a purely, you could say, off chain or, or or transaction pool uh, uh, encryption to be able to uh, to achieve these properties. Now, why aren't why aren't miners doing it today? If this is still something that's actively being researched. Um, I think miners uh, are are very smart, and they they um, they are actually trying to minimize the amount of uh, risk that they pose to their business, and they see that uh, being compatible with uh, uh, with a healthy ecosystem for MEV extraction is actually long term beneficial to to them. Um, so um, if they are uh, found to be um, uh, front running the transactions of their users, uh, users can quite easily decide no longer to send transactions to these miners and instead point transactions to those that uh, operate in a more uh, fair fashion. Um, so there exists some economic reasons why uh, uh, miners sort of behave um, in the way that they do today. 
I know one of the solutions you guys were exploring is this like SGX based solution to do this uh, hidden mempool. How is like the progress on that? And what are other cryptographic solutions you've like considered? Sure. So Sunny uh, actually came on and, and did an MEV roast uh, with us. So MEV roasts are community calls that we have at a regular interval. And uh, we invite uh, great minds in the space to to come host them and, and present uh, some of the core challenges uh, around MEV um, and what is the potential solution space. Um, and I think uh, uh, that's a really interesting uh, uh, video to go watch for what are the different alternatives to mempool level privacy. Um, so the, the one that we're the most excited about right now and the one that we're exploring um, is based on uh, an SGX primitive uh, that essentially uh, uh, performs the validation of transactions on uh, the user side in order to uh, mitigate some of uh, the uh, concerns that we have for privacy and, and spam protection. Um, the reason why we think SGX is a uh, good solution is it's backwards compatible with Ethereum uh, as it functions today without having uh, without requiring any consensus level change. Um, and it's also highly it has good latency properties. So it doesn't introduce uh, unnecessary uh, computation that would prohibit some of the more uh, time sensitive use cases like uh, like arbitrage. We'll be releasing a design uh, for uh, this MEV SGX approach um, very, very soon. Um, and we encourage community feedback. So um, we are at sort of the stage of the proof of concept in, uh, in determining if this is a viable path forward. Um, I think another interesting approach uh, that has a lot of merit and, and could be implemented on Ethereum is a, um, a crypto economic one. So instead of having some sort of cryptographic guarantees on privacy, um, you would have some economic guarantees where the uh, the entities or the searchers that are uh, requesting uh, for block space would be economically bounded uh, for the block space that they're targeting. Um, and if they submit invalid requests to the miners, uh, they would have to have some kind of slashing mechanism that punishes them for uh, submitting invalid requests. Um, so this is another uh, promising path forward. Um, it's not the one that we're exploring immediately. And that's because we think that a purely cryptographic one will always be uh, strictly superior to an economic one. Uh, but it's one that we may uh, uh, we may explore and uh, further in the future if uh, the SGX base approach seems less promising. So currently, does does Flashbots actually increase minor site centralization? Because basically, it um, it creates a barrier to entry for anyone new who's not part of the Flashbots uh, branch. You could frame it that way, but I think it also decreases uh, minor centralization by letting people be part of the Flashbots uh, kind of boat and profit the same as everyone else who's in the Flashbots boat proportional to their hash power. Uh, so I think MEV really is best and works most efficiently when miners and validators have access to value in proportion to their input, their economic input into the network um, in kind of a linear way. So if you have 10% of the hash power, you make about 10% of MEV revenue. If you have 40%, you make about 40%. That just works the best from kind of a system stability and economic analysis uh, perspective. What you really don't want is kind of a super linear function, where if you have 10% of the hash power, you make 5% of the MEV. If you have 40% of the hash power, you make 80% of the MEV. Uh, you don't want that because that's an enormous upward centralization pressure. It's a direct economy of scale, and it kind of works against decentralization in many ways. Um, so the goal of Flashbots is to keep that curve linear and keep the barrier, barrier of entry low. Um, so we are kind of introducing centralization towards this social uh, barrier to entry. We, uh, we basically are kind of, uh, you know, admitting people on the minor side manually uh, into the Flashbots network because there is such a trust-based component and because we're still building out and testing so many different aspects of the system. That's not the ultimate goal. And we know we can build something that's not that, that has much better decentralization properties and doesn't rely on any uh, central actor or third party. And that is kind of the long-term goal. Um, that being said, MEV is already a centralizing force. So because we have so many competitors, when Flashbot started, that curve that we want to be linear was already moving into that super linear mode. And we were already seeing larger, uh, larger miners and larger pools 
that had the engineering resources to do so start to both run their own MEV bots internally, as well as to offer products uh, to people who were running MEV bots that were tailored to their bots and tailored to their operation. Um, so that was already kind of driving the curve away from linear. I think Flashbots has flattened that a lot. Yes, at the expense of kind of this momentary faith that uh, we will be good actors and that we will decentralize things um, and that we will be able to kind of maintain this equilibrium and this balance uh, between all these miners to kind of keep this uh, keep this curve flat for as long as possible. Uh, and I think that's to the benefit of all miners and everyone in the ecosystem. So how are you looking to decentralize this in the future and what's the time scale on that? So I, I'm not going to start like an ETH2 meme of trying to define what the time scale for, for releasing these hard research questions are. Uh, but uh, I will say um, the, the path is is quite clear. Um, it, it is about uh, replacing these these trust guarantees for um, for privacy and um, and and spam protection um, into uh, cryptographic guarantees. Um, and once we're able to uh, to do that, uh, either cryptographic or crypt crypto economic. Um, and once we're able to do that, basically we we can set up the network in such a way that it's um, it's uh, fully uh, decentralized. Um, so for what it's worth, right? We we are actively researching this internally, but we're also uh, doing a lot of uh, um, research with third parties and issuing grants uh, to help move forward uh, the um, the different approaches to to uh, to transaction pool privacy. Um, so if this is a, a hard problem that you're looking to to work on and interested in contributing to, uh, you should definitely reach out to our, our research uh, team and and uh, and participate in those discussions. So two questions I have about the architecture before maybe we move on to some of more into the MEV. But um, the first is like I, I guess you could say one of the things that changed here and why this has like you know the the current gas prices on Ethereum have dropped you know probably significantly because of flashbots is be the reason this works is because you know the, the the bribe the fee being paid to miners is not done until after the transaction executes and is successful and this is you know what like you mentioned preventing all these reverted transactions from happening and meanwhile in normal ethereum transactions the the, the gas fee is paid regardless of successfulness of the transaction but that's done for a reason in order to prevent spam attacks, right? Like, what doesn't this open up a large spam uh, vector on Flashbots if, like, the miner doesn't get paid until they execute the transaction and find out that, it, you know, if I just spam them with a bunch of transactions that fail, they have to execute them to figure out that they fail and realize they don't get paid. Correct. Um, so that's sort of the trade-off that's being made uh, when you think about privacy, is you need a way to validate that the uh, transactions that you're receiving is uh, is a valid one. The way that the regular transaction pool does this, right, is essentially every single node in the network does its part in doing spam protection. So when a node receives a regular transaction, um, it sees the full content of it and is able to uh, assert that the account sending it is able to pay for uh, the uh, amount of gas it requests and has the amount of value uh, sort of on hand. Um, and it, it, like you said, it does pay that through um, through reverts. Now, by uh, creating both a private channel for communication and keeping the reverts off the chain, um, it uh, creates an additional burden on the miners to be able to validate the fire hose of transactions that they'll potentially um, be receiving. Um, so in the short term, uh, during the Flashbots alpha and, and possibly the beta as well, uh, the solution to that is to have uh, highly scalable relays that are able to do that simulation work by essentially just throwing hardware at the problem um, and and protect miners from uh, or mining nodes from from that kind of workload um, in the fully decentralized version um, either uh, some cryptographic proof or crypto economic bonding would be able to mitigate the the spam factors how would a crypto economic bonding work here? Because isn't the challenge that the, the tender doesn't know whether their transaction will succeed or not? Yeah, so basically what you'd have is uh, at a high level, again, these aren't these aren't designs that are fully thought out. So, uh, But at a high level, what you need is for uh, the miners to be able to sort of submit a proof that the request made by the searcher uh, was invalid. 
uh, and for that proof to be able to uh, unlock or slash uh, the bonded value of the searcher. Um, so uh, obviously those proofs aren't specified and how they actually settle and on uh, sort of which layer and which chain they settle is not specified. Uh, but so that's the, the sort of high level architectural design that would be required. The other question I wanted to talk about as well is how does Flashbox deal with reorgs? So, you know, once a, you know, Ethereum doesn't have like this like finality that like, you know, other chains, some other chains have. And so like once a transaction is published in a block, it's wide, widely available. What's to prevent another miner from like purposefully reorg that transaction? Because now that data is already available and they can you know profit off of that. I'd say in the spirit of incentive alignment, what really stops miners is long-term incentive alignment. Um, you are right. It is kind of immediately economically viable in the short term to kind of fight over MEV. There's kind of two things in the metagame that I think work against this. Uh, number one, and no one's really studied this or formalized it, but there's probably some sort of competitive game between miners that if they're all trying to orphan each other and attack each other for MEV, uh, the profitability of this activity kind of reduces drastically uh, because if they're all ignoring each other, they each have kind of success that's proportional to their hash power anyway, which is the same probability they would have had of capturing that original opportunity. Um, so in, in that way, it's kind of not, it is marginally beneficial to kind of go down that short term uh, kind of path in the same way as, as like a prisoner's dilemma. But for the ecosystem, I'd say it's long term, even even less beneficial. And uh, not only does it cause instability, it erodes kind of the long term value and it reduces the amount that's like even in the medium term on the table for miners. Um, so economically, if there's any stickiness in kind of their hash power investment and their infrastructure and their loyalty to the network or any kind of thing like this, uh, they kind of have an incentive to not grief each other and not really degrade service for users and not collapse the MEV market in doing so. That being said, this is kind of a viable attack factor and it is a, a viable thing, especially if maybe a miner is desperate and they're willing to try some kind of short-term tricks to get out of a, a hole or some other kind of desperate situation. So it is in the long-term one that we are thinking about on the research side and that we want to mitigate. I don't think it's unique to Flashbots. I think MEV just introduces this incentive in general. In fact, that's why we originally defined MEV to kind of study how much incentive there was for reorgs at the consensus level. Um, that being said, I do think it's like very important to to come up with mechanisms that formalize this metagame and harmonize these incentives and make sure that there's kind of direct economic incentives for long-term stability as well as indirect incentives and metagame incentives. Yeah, it'd be super interesting to see whether this actually happens because I think, um, I mean, in the short term, being the lone defector obviously pays. So um, whether the long-term um, viability of the ecosystem or the long-term flourishing of the ecosystem is good enough a reason against this, I'm not sure. So I, I guess we'll have to see how this plays out. I think a lot of things, though, are relying on their altruism and are relying on these diffuse incentives, right? Like miners <laughs> could easily, and not that I'm trying to, to make this alternative uh, happen by vocalizing it, but like their incentives are not to mine beacon chain transactions in like the margin unless they kind of believe someone else may mine it for like metagame reasons. But if they all were acting kind of rationally and colluding through this informal channel, even if not directly, they would probably not include beacon chain transactions and try to degrade doing things like staking ETH and try to mess with this transition in more active ways um, and try to, uh, you know, extract as much value as they can while they still can. Uh, I think miners... First of all, mine many other currencies, so they have reputation that goes beyond just ETH, and they have plays that go beyond just ETH. Um, and second of all, I do think that even for people who mine just ETH, that messing with the system is not likely to be long-term more profitable than participating for anyone who has a significant stake. Um, but that is, it, it remains to be seen, like you said. Cool. So this is super interesting. I, I'd like to kind of move on to the legality and morality of this, though. Um, so um, Ari Jewels wrote an article a couple of weeks ago in uh, uh, Coindesk, I think. And it, it was titled Front Running as a Service is Theft. And it had this allegory about the police force of a city um, that I would actually kind of like to, to quote because it is pithy in many ways. So he writes as a suggestion how to see this 
in real life or parallel in, in, in real life. So he writes, we'd like to announce a great new idea we've devised to reform the police. Today, cities direct their police forces to prevent and prosecute theft. But crime is a tough problem and policing is costly. What cities should do instead is auction off the right to mug people and burglarize homes. Sure, burglaries would become more professional to take advantage of any vulnerable property. But on the bright, bright side, cities can use theft auction money to pay city workers' salaries, offset shortfalls in tax revenue, and fund new policing initiatives, including prosecution of unauthorized theft. So how, how would you guys respond to the assertion that you're kind of institutionalizing, exploiting the users? Yeah, you know, I think that's a very common gut reaction to things we're doing and one we almost try to bring out in people because it generates interesting and deep moral discussion that we really welcome and embrace here at Flashbots. Ari is my PhD advisor. Obviously, he's like a longtime collaborator and friend. I've talked for many thousands of hours with him on MEV. I think we have our respective opinions and our respective positions and conclusions that we both have derived from first principles and we both feel strongly about and we both just like differ on some axioms and some some kind of uh, philosophical and kind of qualitative opinions on the world. Uh, that is all to say, like, I think our viewpoints differ less than is expressed by him, you know, kind of characterizing flashbots in this way. Uh, and I like to think that that was kind of an attempt at lighthearted trolling to get people in the community to engage these issues and to point them out as serious. And, you know, we, we do plan on continuing that thread of discussion in our roasts. Obviously, I don't think Flashbots is very similar to theft. Um, I, I think, you know, theft is a very kind of emotional word. It, it kind of relates to using force to overpower someone's personal property. Um, I don't think Flashbots uses force. Uh, we publish code. Um, and I don't think we erode people's personal property in that way. Like, I think if by running, uh, if by writing a hundred line, very obvious, that was kind of being developed anyway, patched to geth and releasing it to miners um, and saying like, here, look at what we wrote. If that leads to widespread theft and burglaring of people's cryptocurrency balances, then the experiment has failed and it was never going to succeed because such a weak attack, such a small expression of existing ex incentives was able to lead to loss of value. That being said, I don't think it's the case. Like, I don't think the real security of value in cryptocurrency really relies on miners. I think there's a number of articles uh, going back since I've been in the space debating who really has this power, is it the users, is it the node operators, is it the miners, who is responsible for enforcing norms and for enforcing value? Uh, it's a complex question and the answer is like probably all these parties, but ultimately the users. Um, and MEV does not rob users of control. It just changes the landscape in which they're expressing transactions to a more kind of efficient machine. That yes, may be worse for them when they use certain mechanisms in outcome. Um, certainly mechanisms that were not designed to handle this and certainly mechanisms which would be insecure if you kind of left all their MEV on the table. Things like Uniswap and like MakerDAO. That being said, I don't think a user using these things in the Flashbots world is getting robbed. Um, I use Uniswap all the time. You know, you can look up my cryptocurrency address. I'm very public about it. I always have been. I use Uniswap. I use MakerDAO. I use systems that have MEV in them. And over time and, and, and doing a lot of thinking about these issues and using these systems, you realize that really the truth is more complicated than any single gut reaction to what kind of activity looks like or what behavior looks like in the space from a cursory glance is. And so I have a very detailed response to kind of those claims and kind of my philosophical argument for, for why we need to extract MEV and what we should do about it on my blog. It's called MEV What Do. It's also on my Twitter. Uh, if you're interested, I, I encourage you to read that. The basic premise is that we're trying to build systems that are economically secure and without extracting MEV and without aligning these incentives, that's not possible. And the cryptocurrency experiment has already failed. And so, so yeah, we do have some philosophical differences on this, on this kind of point um, and on kind of what the best solution is and on how powerful fair protocols are and things like that. Uh, I encourage people to get into the weeds and to engage us in this conversation, but I also encourage people not to kind of go with their first emotional reaction and to let that guide them and to kind of keep that uh, and use it to engage these questions, uh, but also kind of engage these questions on an intellectual level and look at the resources we're putting out and kind of all the thinking we've been doing. Uh, because I think 
nobody in Flashbots is looking to make uh, a world where theft is normalized. Uh, I don't think that's an accurate characterization of anyone who's building in the MEV space in any organization, really, uh, except maybe on the fringes. I'd like to engage with it now, then, if possible. Uh, and, and so it's like, you know, uh, in your in your blog post, like, you mentioned that you think MEV is unavoidable. Why don't I like to talk, understand why you think that's the case? I guess, like, for me, like, the larger thing for me is that, like, you know, it seems that MEV has, like, all these, like, negative side effects, uh, such as, like, consensus instability, these PGAs, uh, like, price spikes, but then it also like you know I think there's negative impact of the like M of the MEV extraction itself, not like a externality, but it's like you know the entire the term itself is has the word extractable, right? You know you're you're clearly extracting something from someone, and you know I, I feel like the Flashbox architecture does a really good job at like helping solve some of these like, externalities, but it's not really like doing much to reduce. MEV at all and like itself and like you know like Phil you mentioned at the beginning like you know you started down this journey with like you know thinking about what makes a secure exchange and like you know making sure everyone has like this like fair pricing and all this kind of stuff but I mean does Flashbox really help solve that? I'd say yes and no. Um, so you're right, I did start down that rabbit hole. And uh, that rabbit hole led me into things like batch auctions. It led me into things like traditional financial research, uh, you know, uh, papers like uh, Eric Budish's, uh, you know, HFT's unfairness, will the market fix the market, which I highly recommend to anyone who's just getting into the tech space or into the market design space. Uh, it led me into like a number of conversations with people at exchanges all around the world on how they viewed fairness and what their market requirements are. Uh, it led me to very deep and very long conversations with projects like Uniswap uh, and other DEXs in the space. Pretty much all DEXs in the space, I think, have been like yelled at by me at some point or indirectly or directly. Um, so this is a, something I feel very passionate about. Um, and, and I agree that MEV Geth itself as a product does not speak to this question. That being said, I think I, I drew two conclusions in my journey of like really trying to show fairness and trying to get batching and get MPC uh, and get all these designs that we're now seeing coming out now that MEV is accelerating into the mainstream like two years ago, right? Uh, and my conclusion is that like some people like the idea of these DEXs, but there are UX trade-offs involved in all these mitigations. Um, and the UX trade-offs make the systems more complex more often than not. So my my thesis following that and like trying to get these projects to adopt fairness, even ones that I advised, right? We, we, we spent some time at, at, at various DEXs, like thinking through, like, how can we combine liquidity from like fair and unfair protocols? What does this even mean? Right. And this led me kind of down market design rabbit holes. Uh, things like why don't batch auctions dominate the world of finance? Why do we still use continuous limit technology? Is it really just political inertia or do certain classes of users prefer these market designs? Is it really just political inertia or is it possible that this kind of mathematical analysis of fairness in these papers uh, is making kind of modeling assumptions which aren't exactly borne out in the real world, or there's some kind of misalignment when you combine these systems with other designs or run multiple versions of this single system in parallel that just escapes the on-paper analysis. So in trying to study these problems, I literally went crazy, like no joke. Um, I encourage anyone to try and like, maybe you'll be better than me at it. Uh, but my conclusion is that like the design space is infinite and there is a lot we can do to reduce MEV, and there's a lot we can do for concrete fairness gains, right? Stopping users from being brutally sandwiched or like screwed for like multiple percentage points. There's a lot of low hanging fruit there, and there's a lot of market designs uh, that are possible in that trade off space. That being said, this concept that like we can just promote one solution or that any solution will kind of encompass and bring all MEV to zero is not something I view as a realistic outcome anymore. Uh, something like Uniswap, where the UX is that you want a trade to be able to be executed in the middle of any function call. There's inherent reasons that introduces MEV, right? Because you don't want to know what trade you're going to do before the transaction is mined. That's the whole point of that UX. That being said, if you don't know what trade that you're going to make before the transaction is mined, you're handing control to the miner to choose that for you. Um, and maybe you want to do that in some cases. Certainly, we've seen many, many types of bots that do that every single day on Ethereum. Uh, so that is all to say, like, I think there's a lot of potential in reducing MEV and exploring new, more fair market designs, 
especially for different use cases. Um, like that's one thing I concluded in my kind of traditional exploration and talking to different exchanges for different products, futures exchanges, derivative exchanges, securities exchanges, commodity exchanges. They all have different designs. They have different rules, different pathologies, different actors with different trade-off preferences, different time horizons, different regulating agencies, different requirements. Um, and I expect the same to be true across fairness protocols. I expect the same to be true across any kind of MEV mitigation. That's not to say these things are useful and that they won't help, but I don't personally have faith and, and I'm open to being challenged on this, but I don't have personally faith that any of this is a silver bullet that reduces MEV to zero, especially because MEV as maximal extractable value really cares about what happens when all your assumptions break and when the only thing that matters is like the brutal reality of the optionality of your decentralized participants and their incentives. Uh, and in those ecosystems, fair market assumptions break down and any kind of bootstrapping assumptions you might make to try to reduce MEV also break down. Uh, and so I think there's a lot of space in the UX for space for MEV and, and a lot of it I, I do personally think is fundamental. Uh, and I encourage people to kind of read my blog post on that if they want more detailed and kind of textualized uh, arguments for that. But at a high level, I, I really do believe that uh, we can reduce MEV and, and we want to reduce MEV at Flashbots. That's an open research challenge. We're funding something we're working on internally. Uh, we're thinking about whether to do that at the DAP layer. We're thinking about whether to do that at L2. We're working with companies like Optimism and other kind of MEV actors in the space. So we're doing a lot of work to try to think through fairness protocols. Um, and we're open to working with anyone in the space on that. So please reach out. Have you guys thought at all about, you know, if you're building this like sort of private mempool using the SGX solution, it's, you know, instead of using it as an MEV for MEV searchers, like why, why not just open it, like try, or it's more about like a positioning thing, right? Anyone can go ahead and pu push to this private mempool. Are you gonna like try to promote like all Ethereum users to like push to a private mempool? So that way, like that, that kind of helps solve, you know, a large amount of the MEV, especially at least a large amount of the extractable MEV, like the one that, that the amount that's being extracted from users. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Um, and actually one that is like vastly under-recognized. Um, I think, the interesting thing about MEV is like, who is it serving? Like, especially pri private transaction pool. Um, who is actually going to be willing to pay for like the development of it? And and who are the like number one users? Uh, but is there a way to convert the work that's being done for the, for for these entities into work that benefits uh, the broad population? Um, I think that's generally the the answer to that question is yes. Um, so. While Flashbots is designed to be incentive compatible for uh, all uh, sort of parties in the MEV game to, to utilize, um, it also opens up a channel for regular users to send their transactions uh, uh, and in a way that's protected from any sort of uh, front running. Um, now, this gets into uh, quite a deep sort of uh, requirement of analysis on what are the types of transactions that are going on on Ethereum and what do these transactions care about? Um, so I think this is uh, quite actually a useful framework for thinking about uh, the future of Ethereum uh, transactions post uh, EIP-1559 as well. Um, there are some types of transactions that are just inherently more vulnerable to being uh, reordered uh, than others. For example, right, uh, Uniswap trade, uh, highly sensitive to reordering, uh, but uh, a CryptoKitty transfer um, is uh, relatively low uh, sensitivity to, to reordering. Um, and so these two different transactions and the users that send these transactions care about very different properties, right? Uh, perhaps the uh, Uniswap trader cares about fastest possible execution and for their execution to sort of be private and for no one to manipulate them. Whereas maybe the CryptoKitty uh, transfer care mostly about censorship resistance and uh, making sure that their transaction is sort of propagated through the network and they know for sure that it's going to be mined uh, and there's no sort of intermediary that, uh, that can interfere with that. Um, I think what we're going to see is uh, different types of transactions will be routed through different uh, networks to be able to uh, reach the miners who ultimately uh, include them on the chain. Um, so these more um, inclusion transaction, I call them, the CryptoKitty transactions, are likely to continue using the uh, typical transaction pool, uh, and and it will meet the requirements much better. Under EIP fifteen fifty nine, you know they'll probably also get a a, a better uh, UX from more stable uh, base fee. 
uh, payments. And it's unlikely that they would have to pay a, a significant amount of tip to be included. Um, whereas there's these other uh, transactions, the, the Uniswap trades or the arbitrage transactions that, that I refer to as priority transactions. These transactions are uh, much more sensitive and likely that the user sending them is willing to pay a lot more uh, for them to be included where uh, they want in in uh, in the in the block space. So um, by pushing these uh, out out of the transaction pool, there's sort of a number of different uh, uh, advantages that it causes for everyone else in the network. One of them is that it removes a lot of the variance in transaction fees uh, that we've been seeing lately, and it, it makes inclusion transactions generally more predictable in how much they will cost. Um, and the second one is that it uh, provides a, a channel for uh, competition uh, uh, of, of inclusion to like really tailor itself to the properties that those users provide on uh, or care about. Like, do those users who are sending arbitrage transaction, do they care about um, censorship resistance or do they care about minimal latency? And if there's a trade-off in design in the communication channel between them and, and miners, uh, which one will they prefer? Um, I think this is where uh, having a variety of different solutions that are able to provide a different features to various different uh, uh, transaction centers becomes particularly interesting. Well, I think one of the other interesting things that, you know, we learned about like the MEV in the last couple months is this whole dark forest thing and this idea of generalized front runners. Could you like tell us a little bit about what these are and like, you know, Phil, you mentioned you had some really fun stories about them. I'd love to hear like what are, you know, some of these wacky situations that we see on, on chain. Yeah, I would love to describe it. So my journey kind of started, I think it was like 2018 or something like that, when I published the Ether Delta blog post with a bunch of co-authors. Um, uh, I think uh, if you Google Ether Delta in my name, you'll probably find that piece of, uh, you know, archaeological MEV history. But basically, we'd been running trading bots for some time at that point to kind of validate for ourselves, are these real economic flaws in the protocols? How much power is there in transaction ordering? And can it really be profitable for miners? And can it really be profitable for bots through the mempool who aren't directly colluding with miners? So those are kind of the questions that that blog post set out to answer uh, through very practical experiments of actually running these bots and measuring our own success rate. Uh, and pretty early on, we noticed that there was a pattern of bot that was using all sorts of different tricks uh, to kind of profit. Uh, so there are two kinds of bots that, that we noticed very early on. One of them was a bot that had a strategy um, or an intent that was kind of to extract value in some way. And another was a kind of copycat bot, which would do a more generalized strategy. That was the kind of name that started being introduced for them in blog posts when people started seeing this on chain. So early on, these generalized strategies were very simple. They would be something like every transaction that comes in on the mempool, I'm going to run the same transaction. Uh, with the same data payload and the same contracts and the same everything, but I'm just going to replace the sender with myself. And if I have more ETH at the end of the transaction than at the beginning, then I'm going to calculate how much profit I made, let's say $50, and I'm going to fire off this minor auction with like a $50 profit parameter. So I'll bid in a certain way, depending on like how much profit I get and everything like that. So that was kind of the first iteration of bots. And there were all sorts of sophisticated techniques. Even in 2018, we started observing with these bots going back and forth with each other and back and forth with bots that were specifically designed to do certain things. Uh, a big place people noticed this early was CryptoKitties uh, birthing because CryptoKitties birthing is very easy to kind of just swap yourself into and make the same amount of money. So those kind of early transactions were pretty much always being taken by these copycat bots. Uh, then people started kind of building protections in to protect against these bots, things like for example, when Geth simulates uh, transactions that aren't in a block yet uh, to see whether they're profitable like these front runners would do, it might use a simulated value for block hash or it might use a simulated value for the timestamp rather than using the real value. And if you condition your transaction flow based on this, you can trick these bots into making the wrong transactions uh, that lose them money or into missing transactions that could potentially make them money. Um, and this kind of war back and forth started escalating really, really drastically like with EtherDelta, with 0x, with all these early DEX protocols. Um, the experience I kind of had with it was uh, I can't really disclose much specifics uh, because, because they are, you know, kind of a company in the space. But uh, at some point I was called in to help deal with an exploit. And this was like about, you know, 
six months to a year before the Ethereum is a dark forest article came out. I'd been kind of dealing with these front runners for a while and running bots and like had some experience in like on-chain kind of uh, stuff. And so I had a, a, a company I was advising call me and say, look, we found a bug in something uh, that we've exposed. And like, there's kind of this amount of money at stake. Let's say a straw man, $5 million at stake. Um, and, uh, and what do we do, right? And so that's when we started really getting to the hairiness of permissionless systems. Uh, there was an open question of like, do we tell people? Well, if we tell people, we don't know whose people this money is. It's just random addresses, right? If the hacker sees this exploit before the people whose money it is, the hacker is going to steal their money and we've contributed to that. Does that open legal liabilities on our front for like exploiting people's money that are using the network? Should we instead try to recover it ourselves now that we found this uh, as like the most economically advantageous solution? What about the risk that some bot on the mempool or anyone on Ethereum will see these transactions, especially if they fail and especially if we fuck them up and do something wrong, will see these exploit attempts because this is a public space and, and try to front run and then all the user's money will be lost also that way. So we spent like two days kind of coding an exploit, which was the, the eventual decision we went with uh, and adding all sorts of different protections that I could think of for, for front running bots, things like doing weird like modular arithmetic on like the block hash exponentiated and like, you know, just as much as I could think about to use as many inputs as possible. And with the idea of tricking their static analysis, uh, using different contracts, different call frames that called each other, all things kind of Dan described in his article, uh, we tried to do. Um, and then we crossed our fingers and we did all the testnet transactions and they all worked and we fired these transactions off to mainnet with 10 million bucks in the mempool and a very high gas price to try to not get mined, not get front run. And there were four different vulnerable contracts that all had the same code, but had different kind of crypto pairs, four or five, I don't remember, something like that. And wait a few seconds, the block is mined, kind of suspense in everyone's stomach in the war room, open the block. And of the five transactions we did, four of them have the red exclamation point next to them on Etherscan, which if you run our boss, you know, that means you fucked up or someone else <laughs> beat you. It's like the last thing you want to see. So I was like, oh, crap, we've just lost, you know, millions of dollars of other people's money ended up not being the case. So the ARB bots got really unlucky. They had a bug in their own code. It's purely due to a bug. They were not able to front run the bulk of the value. And actually, of our five different transactions, they had slightly different interactions with the network. So some of them ended up going through, some of them not. Basically, all the money ended up being recovered in like a very lossy, stressful process. Uh, but what really blew me away at that time, and it's something I actually wrote a blog post on and never really published it. Uh, but it, the sophistication really is impressive. And in that time period, which was about 2018 to 2019, from when I first started dealing with these bots to when this story happened, uh, like the level of analysis and the level of tooling that was brought was so obviously so much higher that it really speaks to how powerful these incentives are and how robust this ecosystem is. So yeah, I think that's a cool story. And, uh, you know, that's happening on Flashbots every day. So I'm very excited about that. I had, a, I posed a... Uh philosophical question on Twitter, like I think maybe a week or two ago, where like, if you're running a generalized front runner and you accidentally front run a hack, are, are you like, is it ethical to keep the money? And, and, and the overwhelming answer was like, no, you're supposed to return it. But then, you know, what if you take it a step further? What if you automate the spending of the money as well? Like, what if, you know, you donated it to Gitcoin and like, People are like, oh, okay, well, you know, then the Gitcoin people should give it back. And I'm like, okay, fine. What if I thought that MEV is like, you know, I'm trying I'm trying to return the value back to Ethereum. It's something that came from Ethereum, I'm trying to give it back to Ether holders. So I take all it, convert to ETH, and burn the ETH. And I do this in an automated way. So that and now there's like no way for any and what if I did this to a hack by accident? Um, is this like ethical? And I guess what I'm trying to get at is like, is the notion of like inherently automating what you do with money somewhat unethical? Ooh, that's a question for Vlad. So I'd love to hear Stefan's ethical perspective on this because I've been talking a lot. I will just make a practical <laughs> point, which is that these are all questions that I've like struggled with since we started this in, in research in the space. And that, you know, in 2018, we were trying to get answers inside Cornell from like researchers of like, even us running an R bot and measuring how profitable it is, that is active intervention. That's kind of changing user outcomes. Uh, in the name of an experiment. What should we do with the money? Should we fund research? Should we give it back to the users who are front run? Should we burn it? You know, uh, what if we're not profitable? Like, these are all kind of very heavy moral questions uh, that the 
computer science research and engineering process is very ill-equipped uh, to handle um, in, in across the board, in academia, in industry, everywhere. And like that's something I really want to build in Flashbots is an organization that's able to robustly tackle in the long term those hard questions. Super interesting and hard questions. I have a I have an easy technical question, I guess. Um, so we've we've um, concentrated on layer one so far. So what happens to MEV um, on layer two? Does is this different than layer one MEV, or did, is it pretty much the same only in green? Yeah, so for layer twos, um, I, I would sort of classify layer twos as a very still undefined uh, design space. Um, there's a variety of different approaches to transaction ordering in uh, in those frameworks. Um, but broadly speaking, perhaps I can I can give uh, my intuition of how to think about the problem. Um, so MEV exists whenever there is some kind of uh, ordering, um, and for as long as there's a, a specific party that has the uh, the ability to decide uh, the order arbitrarily uh, without any bounds, and that entity is uh, a profit motivated entity, uh, and what they're looking for is to generate the most amount of value, and so they're rationally incentivized. Um, they will have some kind of uh, desire to uh, be maximally extractive, so long as it doesn't compromise the system and the guarantees that they provide in in uh, in their system. Um, so um, there's sort of a bounded rationality, which is going to be uh, how much MEV can I extract without losing all my users? <laughs> That's sort of, I think, the game that a lot of these uh, layer twos or alternative um, uh, Ethereum infrastructures are, are going to be asking. Um, and so it will be really interesting to see how they tackle this question and and engage with um, uh, with answering what what is okay to extract and what is not okay to extract for them. And if there's some competition around like providing these various different guarantees that emerges. Interestingly enough, um, it's actually much easier to uh, limit the MEV extraction in a permissioned uh, protocol than in a permissionless protocol. Um, and so if any of these layer two systems rely on some sort of decentralized approach to sequencing, where there's multiple different entities that are able to uh, to perform these orders, um, usually that also relies on these entities being profit maximizing and there's some kind of crypto economic incentive for them to play that role. Um, these uh, parties can also be expected to want to extract as much as they possibly can. Um, and so uh, there will be sort of a similar dynamic to what we've been seeing in, in sort of permissionless uh, proof of work mining uh, that, that we expect to emerge. Yeah, I mean, I, I have some a lot of thoughts on this as well because you know I've been working on a lot of similar things. I mean, I, I I personally think that at L two, I think just because of the amount of flexibility, I, I really like Flashbots as like a solution at layer one because I think like the at least Ethereum is like very slow moving to upgrade its protocol and like they they made certain design choices that I think like block off the ability to do a lot of like MEV reduction. But I think at layer two, you just have so much more flexibility on your design. And like, you know, just the fact that you can use like finality favoring protocols like Tendermint and you can, you know, you can use like fixed validator sets rather than like, you know, a, you know, proof of work. And even ETH 2.0 wants this like, you know, more liveness favoring protocol. Like I think that actually limits you from a lot of things. So I, I think the MEV story on layer two is actually going to play out quite differently than... Uh, on base chain Ethereum, but we'll, we'll see how that goes. I'm I'm really excited to see how how these systems develop. I think we've seen uh, definitely a significant amount of interest in in MEV both on on ETH two uh, proof of stake systems and and uh, and layer two systems. Um, the sort of narrative that I think uh, I'm really excited to see if it ex uh, it becomes. Um, more prominent is for uh, miners or validators or sequencers to subsidize uh, essentially all the fees for their users, uh, depending on uh, the amount of MEV that they expose. Um, so you could see a framework where you have a pure MEV chain that is completely free to use um, and uh, users only pay through the exposing some MEV with their uh, interactions. Um, that would be a really interesting chain, I think, for uh, to, to have some experiments around. I would agree with that. And I'm also interested in like the practical comparisons of the different L2 design spaces. Like Arbitrum is trying to use a fair sequencing protocol. They're trying to make trust assumptions. 
and see if those trust assumptions can lead to more efficiency for users and if the design trade-offs are worth it. Optimism is trying to optimize for MEV extraction and uh, work with approaches like flashbots and kind of engender similar bot ecosystems in their uh, layer twos. So I think in many ways, layer twos are like microcosms of the layer one design space. These are also all things layer ones can and probably will experiment with. Uh, I get tagged on Twitter you know, at least three times a week of someone who's like, here's my L1 protocol, it solves MEV, literally since 2018, at least three times a week. Uh, so if you've sent me such a message and, and I didn't reply, I apologize. It's not because I don't love you. It's just because like, it's very hard to evaluate all these designs and they all have very complex trade-offs. The only way to see what will happen is when the rubber meets the road. So uh, I think L2 is like a perfect sandbox for that to start happening. And I'm very excited to see how those interactions play out. On Epicenter a couple of weeks ago, we had um, Joey Zacker from uh, KeeperDAO, which is a project that kind of allows a group of people or the KeeperDAO to kind of counteract MEV. Last night, I saw the ArcherDAO project for the first time. So basically kind of projects that, that have grouped around this MEV area in kind of trying to counter it in some way or other. What are your thoughts on these? Yeah, so I can I can uh, give my perspective here. I think it's really interesting uh, to see these uh, what I would call uh, application level mitigations to uh, MEV, um, and I think like this is only uh, the start of the exploration of the various different uh, design patterns uh, that we can do by uh, essentially sandboxing who is able to extract the value from uh, ordering of transactions. Um, and redirecting that in various different ways and creating various different financial products using these cash flows. Uh, basically, the way that I see uh, MEV mitigation is there's three potential layers. Um, there's the application layer, which is where these sort of smart contract based designs are playing. There's the uh, transaction pool uh, layer, which is where uh, Flashbots is playing. And then there's the consensus layer, which is where uh, a lot of the layer twos uh, and, and alternative blockchains are playing uh, and, and trying to insert some kind of uh, mitigations and and um, uh, alternative approaches to to MEV. Um, I expect the application layer to be where we see a lot of blossoming and experimentation and all kinds of different approaches to creating sandboxes for for these cash flows. Though I don't expect these to be able to capture all of the uh, MEV that is available on a chain. Um, there's just going to be some dynamics where there's some interaction and the interaction space is too large to be able to sandbox everything. Uh, and so ultimately, there will always be some uh, some value that flows back to uh, the ultimate sequencers, which which are the miners on on ETH one. Cool. That's a, that's that's a very comprehensive answer. So as for your own business model, um, so I know you guys collected VC money and you're you're collecting another round right now. So what what's the Flashbot's long term business model? Because so far, as you said in the beginning, you don't have a token. Um, you're not extracting value yourself. So what's the game plan? Yeah, we're like the least interesting VC back company because we don't have a token, we don't have a business model, and we essentially made zero promises that we will have one anytime soon. Um, and I think that's actually critical for us because what we see ourselves as building is a long-term focused research organization that's uh, tasked with are uh, trying to answer and solve some of the hardest research questions that the space is faced with. Um, and uh, taking such a long-term approach requires all of our stakeholders to be sort of aligned. Um, so uh, our initial capital partner, right, uh, Paradigm, um, they sort of, we, we selected them because they both have a proven track record of alignment with the ecosystem. Um, they have a very long-term focus, um, and they have a very research-oriented uh, uh, team and, and thesis. Um, so that's uh, that's essentially how we we go about selecting um, uh, capital partners um, and 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 bringing them on board to uh, to our mission. There's, uh, I think, a really interesting approach to thinking about company building, which is um, it's actually a, a sort of a coordination technology, um, and it can be uh, used for uh, many different objectives. Um, if the core objectives of that organization is to produce some kind of uh, social good, um, there's nothing that says it can't produce that, as well as generate some kind of value for the uh, contributors and, and early backers of, uh, of that company. And I think that's very much so a, a direction that that we're hoping to go with uh, with the organization. 
Um, so both generate a lot of uh, uh, good research, build some some really useful products, um, and and uh, and and create the opportunity for a, a broad ecosystem of stakeholders to participate in the value we create. So, so what's the plan for Flashbots for the next year or so? We'll just keep building. Um, yeah, <laughs> I think you know we started the year with zero hash rate, uh, and now now we're in a very different place, um, and I think. As uh, as the adoption and ecosystem of MEV continues to evolve, our sort of roles and responsibilities and and the the stakes that are at play uh, continue to increase. Um, we are like extremely focused on building things that aren't reactive, but instead take into consideration what we expect the incentives to play out in five to ten years, um, and that continues to be sort of the approach that we take in in solving these problems. We think what is the uh, the specific Uh, actions, what are the specific products, and what are the, the questions that we need to answer today to be able to make sure that we achieve the, the objectives that we have in, in, the, in the long run. Um, so, um, you know, more practically speaking, what are we focused on right now? So um, some of the questions that we mentioned around SGX, um, around uh, uh, privacy and, and spam protection are some immediate uh, sort of concerns that, that uh, um, we really want to engage with the community and 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 uh, get a whole group of people to help us answer. Well, the way that we sort of think about um, our approach to solving these problems is to uh, create the most interesting group uh, for anyone to be working with in the space. Um, we sort of see Flashbots as being a talent black hole, where if your interest in in solving uh, large problems that have a large impact and uh, have uh, some level of skin in the game and being able to to solve them uh, will be will be sort of the the no-brainer organization um, and so really our focus is continuing to build an organization that's be able to attract these kinds of uh, of uh, individuals yeah completely echo everything stefan said i think we're entering a kind of a political minefield and it's only going to accelerate as cryptocurrencies uh Yeah, increase in value and intensify and become increasingly important to uh, geopolitics and ordinary users and all these kinds of uh, different scenes we have. Um, I think a lot of these stories will play out in the MEV world. Um, and having an organization that's really focused long term on the ecosystem is super critical. Um, and yes, we are VC backed. We've been very clear that we don't know what our business model is. As Stefan said, we invite anyone who's listening to this who wants to help us figure it out to come in our discord. Uh, we're operating as kind of a hacker collective in principles and organization and in how we plug people into our mission. Our focus right now is kind of solely on solving this the, this incentive alignment problem that we've identified. Um, and our broader agenda is to kind of advance the fairness, efficiency, and feasibility of cryptocurrency mass adoption. Um, from that front, I think all of our venture capital partners are extremely aligned Uh, we would only consider partners where there was no strong expectation or pressure to profit, especially not through certain mechanisms. Um, tokens is a very popular one. If anyone's raised VC in crypto, you know every VC wants a token because it's an easy liquid exit and blah, blah, blah. Uh, we resist that pressure because we don't know if a token is the best design. In fact, we think we've gotten so far as a credibly neutral organization to 80% hash power in just a matter of months because we don't have a token and because the incentives of our token are not counter to those of ETH. Um, and because of our, our reputations as kind of being aligned with ETH. Um, so I think any any partners we choose kind of are going to share that position. I think there's a lot of venture capital in the space that has money because of the bull market and that is aligned with cryptocurrency, that believes in cryptocurrency and that's invested in cryptocurrency hundreds of times over what they're invested in flashbots. Um, and I think the problems we're solving are so critical for the space and, and touch every single investment and every single project in the space to such an extent that any investor we have should understand that the upside on their other projects is much more than like having a specific business model in Flashbots. Um, so that's kind of how we're thinking about it and, and what we're building and how we see the next phase of really laying the groundwork for this long-term unstoppable organization. Cool. I look forward to see where it's going, Phil and Stefan. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, if people want to join the Flashbots team or find out more about you, where should they go check? 
unfortunately, we still don't have a website. <laughs> so that's not something that we're good at is building websites, but we are good at, at writing Ethereum code. Um, so if you go check out uh, on, on GitHub, you'll find all the information uh, that we have about our organization. It's uh, github.com slash flashbot slash PM for, uh, for product management. Um, and it'll have all the resources you need to learn about MEV, learn about the or organization and, uh, and start engaging in the conversation. Perfect. Thank you both. Yeah, thank you for the conversation. Appreciate it. Thanks so much for having us. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, SoundCloud, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have a Google Home or Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Epicenter podcast. Go to epicenter.tv slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for the newsletter so you get new episodes in your inbox as they're released. If you want to interact with us, the guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we're always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week. <laughs>